So who is your neighbor? And I think that with this COVID lockdown for the last 18 months, it's been tough for us to meet new neighbors or to really be neighborly to our neighbors. And I think when COVID is over, we're going to have to be going like crazy to make up for the isolation that we've been stuck in, right? So keep that in mind. The neighbors are important and we need to reach out to them and we need to get to know them. So the concept of who is my neighbor comes from the story of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10. And there was a lawyer who asked Jesus that very question. He said, who is my neighbor? And Jesus did not directly answer that question, but instead he said what it takes to be neighborly. And being neighborly means being kind and loving to those in need in a proactive manner. So I'm sure that over the years you've heard many sermons about this topic, right? It's a very popular scripture. Uh, who's my neighbor and how do you be neighborly and, and so on. And I'd like to provide my perspective on who your neighbors are. And these days, it's not just the person who's living next door to your house. It could include people you interact with in your workplace. It could be families that you interact with, uh, with your kids, you know, on, on, on their hockey teams, Ellie, Joy, I bet you meet other parents there. They're your neighbors. You hang out with them at the hockey rink. And uh, dance teams or whatever, if you go to the gym, there's always, you, you pick your favorite bike. You always sit in the same bike every week, right? And the guy sitting next to you is the same guy in that bike every week. So that's your neighbor too. So these are who your neighbors are. And with the internet these days, your neighbor could be someone who lives halfway around the world, as long as you're interacting with them. So in the end, everybody that you come in contact with is your neighbor. And based on my background in the business community as, a, as an accountant, I've tended to categorize the ability to love your neighbors as being either personally loving your neighbors or corporately loving your neighbors. So in the uh, left-hand side of this picture, you see a picture of a, a lady bringing a, a meal to an elderly gentleman. So she is being a personal neighbor. She's bringing them dinner. And we can do that. And then on the other side, I, I think of corporately, uh, there's a picture of me and my team at, at Welsh. And uh, we went to the auto mission, because I was on the board of the auto mission for five or six years. And we would go and serve meals at different points in time. So to me, that's uh, what a corporate neighbor is. A corporate neighbor is an organization that serves people in need in our community and relies on individual volunteers and employees to execute the neighborliness. So I've given you an example of the auto mission where I was on the board there for years. And I've got a couple of friends here today, Joanne and Wayne, who just started in the mission in Ottawa called Whitestone. And they, well, John's retired from work, Wayne's still working. And uh, they've got this ministry going that helps people who are coming out of prison or have addiction issues or recovery issues, and they help them reintegrate into the workforce. And they need volunteers and people with expertise to be able to help them execute that corporate neighborliness, right? So when I think of the Ottawa mission, even though I would put on the apron and serve food from time to time, and uh, I continue to donate money to the mission so they can continue to afford to buy food for the clients. But in the end, it's the mission which is being neighborly to the homeless. And I'm part of the corporate team that helps them meet their goal. It'd be the same for Whitestone and any other ministry that, that you've been involved with. So the homeless are not necessarily my neighbors, but I'm working through a corporate neighbor to help love the homeless and the hungry. And if you're passionate about a certain organization or movement and the work they do, I encourage you to get involved so that you can help them be a strong neighbor to those people. And I encourage you to find out where your passion is. What is the passion that you identify with? And what giftings do you have to help the corporate neighbor? So here's some gifts that some of us have and that you can share. So one would be wisdom or expertise. I think of uh, my wife, Kathy, who's on the board of a, a Canadian charity called Help Lesotho. And Help Lesotho is an organization in Canada that goes to 
the country of Lesotho, which is in South Africa, kind of like the donut hole in South Africa. And uh, what Kathy does as an accountant, she's an accountant too, she coaches the accountant who's on site in Lesotho, a native from that country who didn't have a lot of experience as an accountant. So every month, Kathy gets on uh, FaceTime or Zoom or something and mentors this accountant in South Africa. So she's able to share her expertise with them and that's a gift that she has to share. Uh, time. Sometimes when I hear Mikey talk about working 16 hour shifts, he doesn't have a lot of time to be volunteering, but some people have time. And I think of time as being something you can donate. And I always think about donating blood. And when you're done donating blood, you get to eat cookies and have this drink of fruit juice, right, or coke. And there's always somebody there who's handing out the cookies and the fruit juice. And it's not hard to do that, but it takes time. And that person is volunteering and helping Canadian Blood Service as a corporate neighbor to make sure that people who are in the hospital have the blood that they need and the donors feel accepted and loved while they're donating blood. Uh, money is another thing. Charities need money in Canada. Unfortunately, uh, most of us have jobs and we need to be making sure that we take some of that money off the top of the list, not what's left over, but from the top, and to be giving it to charities that we're passionate about. And leadership skills. I mean, a lot of charities are looking for people on boards. I don't know, I, I probably get a phone call every three months at work from somebody wanting me to join the board as a treasurer. And I just have to say no, because I know them so many. I mean, I'll, I'll pray about it and get God's guidance. But if you've got leadership skills, they can be very valuable. I mean, maybe you're the director of human resources at your company, and uh, a board of directors needs help with human resources issues. Well, that would be a good place for you to join if you have the time. So keep that in mind. Go through and analyze what your gifts are that God's given you and how you can share those with corporate neighbors. And one of the things I've learned by volunteering with many corporate neighbors is that you are a blessing to those you serve, but your experience can also bless you as well. And uh, most of you know the story about Hannah. When she was 18, first year university, called up Kathy and said, I'm pregnant. And it's like, what? Where did that come from? But I had just come off the board at First Place Options, which is a local Christian crisis pregnancy center. I'd been on the board for six years. Didn't know anything about it when I joined the board, but when my term was up at the end of six years, I knew a lot about what was going on with unplanned pregnancies. And so God blessed our family through that experience that I had helping a corporate neighbor, because I could tell Hannah, and you gotta come home from university and go for counseling, and um, you can make your decision, an informed decision. But she did make a decision to have the, uh, have the baby and place it for adoption. And Skylar, our granddaughter, will be uh, eight in about three weeks. So it's just amazing how you can be blessed by blessing others through working in a corporate neighborly perspective. So the second way I categorize being neighborly is, is personally. And I showed that picture of the, the uh, cooking pot there a while ago. But being kind and loving to your actual next door neighbors is important too. And I just finished reading this book called The Art of Neighbor. Fairly short read, and if anyone wants to borrow it, I'm glad to lend you one. And the authors did a survey of people who identify as Christians, and they found out that less than 10% of Christians can name their eight closest neighbors. Less than 3% can provide basic facts about the neighbors. So maybe there's an extra seven there that you know, could actually name them, but they can't provide any facts. And then only 1% could actually share deep values that each of the neighbor holds. And those are Christians who did the survey. So how are we going to love our neighbors if we don't know our neighbors. How do we do that? This is a, a chart that was in the book. And what this is, is it's a block of nine blocks. Your house is in the middle, 
and you're thinking of the other eight blocks as being your eight closest neighbors. And on line A, what you're encouraged to do is to write down your neighbors' names. On line B, you would write down some basic facts about your neighbors. And on line C, to get to know the deeper values and write those down as well. So when I live on the river, I'm kind of like, my house isn't in the middle. How do we organize this? So don't get, don't get too freaked out about the, the way that it's laid out with your house in the middle. Maybe it's a string, because you live on a rural road, and there's a river on the other side, and you only have neighbors on one side. So put it out as a string. Whatever works for you. You know, draw the river in there. Draw the high road. Draw whatever it is, but look for your eight closest neighbors and write their names down and get to know them. And maybe you could end up with a block party. You know, I had a neighbor of mine lives uh, halfway between my house and, and here, who um, I just ran into on the way over and, and talked to him. He watched the uh, prayer breakfast online uh, yesterday afternoon, and he was, he, he's going to come over and talk to me this week, and I imagine he's going to talk about having a block party that he would help us host to get to know our neighbors. So something to really keep in mind. I think that many of us are afraid to reach out to our neighbors because we feel that our calendar is already too full or that if we end up with a neighbor who's in need, they'll keep asking us for help and just overwhelm our schedule. But there's a, an important scripture in 2 Timothy uh, 1 verses 6 to 7 that says, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but he gave us a spirit of power, love, and self-control. So God is calling us to use the spirit of love to fan into flames the gifts that God has given us. And those gifts are already inside of us. We don't have to buy them or learn them. We have gifts. They're unique to us. We need to be sharing those. So I think that gifting or sharing your gifts with your personal neighbors is easier, perhaps, than the corporate neighborliness. Because sometimes it's just about saying hi to the neighbor and having a conversation when they're raking the leaves or something. Or maybe your neighbor's car is in the garage and you need a drive, and you can just give them a drive. Very quick and easy. Or one of my neighbors, I, I said on Friday morning, or maybe you just made two pies instead of one to take a pie to your neighbor. So one of my neighbors who watched the, uh, the thing online Friday, yesterday morning, drove over and brought six muffins. She had made three dozen muffins that morning and broke them up into groups of six and delivered them to her neighbors. So, awesome. inspirational. And the muffins were great. <laughs> uh, I remember the first house that I bought back in 1986. It was a townhouse in India and uh, in Greenboro. And I remember helping our next door neighbor move some furniture up into the bedroom. And I realized that their bedroom was like right next to mine. And our heads when we were sleeping would have been three feet apart. It's like, so crazy. But anyway, that's, that's a neighbor. So anyway, the, uh, the guy's name was Andy. He was married to a lady. He was a very uh, a genius, this guy. And he had a business that was in the satellite industry. And um, he was making a lot of money. I ended up being his accountant, worked with him for years. And then something, we just kind of drifted apart. His business quieted down and I kind of lost touch with them. They had moved to another house. We moved out to Manatee by then. And then one day I get a call, this was probably 10 years ago, from Andy. And he says that his wife was kicking him out of the house and he needed a place to stay. So we invited Andy to come out and he stayed with us in Manatee for a couple of weeks until he found a place to stay. But it was at the YMCA in Ottawa. And I think he expected that to be a short term thing. But I believe Andy was facing some mental health issues, like kind of going off the deep end, and um, it wasn't good. So Andy ended up living at the Y in the cement block room that was like six feet by 10 for 10 years. And every summer I'd take Andy out to lunch at the Colony Pizza downtown. And then at Christmas I'd send him a, a Christmas card with a Tim Hortons gift card in it. So we'd keep in touch with Andy that way, and he'd always send an email back, uh, thanking me for the card and, and wishing my family a uh, Merry Christmas and so on. 
And then during COVID, uh, this spring, I got a call from his ex-wife. And she said that Andy was dead. Andy was found dead outside the grocery store, uh, Loblaws, on the, right next to the Queensway, across the Queensway from the YMCA. And uh, prob probably a heart attack or something. And it was, a, it was a, a real shocker for me. And so she was asked by the white way to clean out his room. And there really wasn't much in there. Everything that was in the room fit into one shopping bag. It was like a pair of pants. And, and the only thing on his desk were the, the last three Christmas cards that I had sent him wow. from the last three years. And it was so touching to hear that. But I realized that something as simple as that, sending a Christmas card and taking Andy out to lunch, can have a huge impact on your neighbors. And we need to be doing that with people because we never know what they're going through. And I'm not trying to brag here because um, honestly, I could be a better neighbor to so many people. And I wish I could. But I've learned some lessons from that and I'm trying to be a better neighbor today than I was last year. So I encourage you to complete that chart. You know, you don't need it actually, if you want to Google it, you can. But it's pretty easy. There's nine boxes, one or two of your, or your neighbors. So it's pretty easy. Get support from your family or talk about it in your triad and uh, find out how you can support each other that way. And one of the first observations I made after receiving the ALS diagnosis is how most of our conversations with people we know are really surface conversations and we're not digging in as deep as we should be. And as people would phone me at work, let's say, who knew nothing about my diagnosis, I realized the first person, or the first thing anyone says is, hey Garth, it's, uh, it's Bob calling, how are you doing? And then I realized that the typical answer would be, oh hey, hi Bob, I'm doing great, haven't talked to you in a long time, how are you doing? And then Bob would say, oh, everything's fine with me, but I want to talk with you about this tax issue I have with CRA. Right, so all of that, hi, I'm fine, it's just kind of, Let's blow through this and get to the real conversation. But I think what we need to do, we need to be digging deeper into our conversation. We need to find out how are our friends, your colleagues, your coworkers, your clients. And we don't expect to hear a negative answer coming back. But when we answer that question, we try to get over it as quickly as possible to get to the heart of the, the conversation. We really don't care how somebody's doing. Most people answer the question, things are fine. But the fact is, in most cases, they're not fine. People are struggling with something. We all are. So when you call someone or see them face to face, I'd encourage you to be digging deeper. And maybe, you know, because of COVID, you can just simply ask them, hey, COVID's been rough, hasn't it? And is there anything that's stopping you from enjoying life these days? Like, ask a serious question. And maybe it doesn't have to be the way you open the conversation, but make sure you ask it before you close the conversation and really find out about how your neighbors are doing. Get real and personal with your neighbors. You know, it's been tough for me to tell the ALS truth to people because when they phone me up and say, hey Garth, how are you doing? And they don't know anything about ALS. I'm like, well, it's funny you should ask that question. You know, and then I have to tell them. I can't keep it a secret. Uh, and what it is, what it does for me when I when I answer that question for people who call, is it gives them a chance to be neighborly to me. And it's been a real benefit. I mean, one of our neighbors, the one who brought the muffins over yesterday, I volunteered because I can't lift heavy stuff anymore. In fact, this, this glass glass is really heavy, and I prefer the plastic one. <laughs> but honestly, and uh, so I've got a soft water sock here in the basement that takes these big bags of salt. So a neighbor goes to the hardware store and gets the bags of salt, brings them to our house, carries them into the basement, and puts them in the water socket. Like, what a great neighbor. And they volunteered to do that. Uh, my best friend from university, he used to call me up once a week, but now he calls me every day. He's made a point of doing that every day, at least once, sometimes two or three times. And he comes over to my place every other week uh, to play a board game or something in the evening. So a best friend can be, um, is, is really engaging, which is great. And then I've got Mike and Rita, 
who will send me an email every day, each one of them. Mike will send one and Rita will send one with simple words of encouragement from scripture every day. So 14 emails a week. How encouraging is that? And even though you live four hours away, you're my neighbors. Yeah. Now I love you for that. Yeah. Now we had a team of six people come over and help me take the dock and the boat lift out of the water. It was great to be able to do that. Um, so many opportunities for people to be neighborly, and I'm so thankful for that. And I'm thankful for John and Wayne, who I introduced earlier, who are the ones that started the prayer blog for me called PrayForGarth.ca. And they're encouraging me to try to reach a thousand people to sign up on this list to pray for me. So you guys are my neighbors too. Thank you for that. Huh. One of the things I noted when I'm typing out uh, my talk is that when I spell neighbor, I spell it the way that I did when I was in public school, which is N-E-I-G-H-B-O-U-R-I-N-G with the U, which is the way that English and British spell it. But the book is, it doesn't have the U, it's just got the O. And then I realized, you know what? You are the, you are the, you is the important thing in every way. <laughs> Keep that in mind. I'm not saying that Americans are worse neighbors than we are, <laughs> but yeah, you are the key to, to neighborliness. So I uh, keep that in your spelling. So that was kind of uh, the talk that I gave on Friday, and I want to extend this a bit uh, to, to just first of all go back and look over God's commandments. Now you know God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, right? Don't steal, don't kill, don't do this, and don't do that. But what were the, the main three commandments that Jesus gave? What was number one? Love God. Love God. Love God with all your heart, strength, and mind. And what was the number two commandment? Love your neighbor as you love yourself, which I just talked about. So what's the third commandment? Matthew 28. It's called the Great Commission. And it says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So, for a follower of Christ, your next commandment is to be a disciple maker, to take that love that you receive and spread it to others, and make them followers of Christ. And as a leadership team, we've been starting to dig into this, right, Doug? And I expect you're going to be hearing from. I've dug in sermons over the next little while about disciple making. But I just wanted to take this opportunity to introduce the topic to you. If you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, then becoming a disciple maker is a task that has been assigned to you. Jesus gave you that role. And I'm, you know, if you think about corporate discipleship versus personal, I'm a much better corporate disciple maker than a personal one. You know, I, I do talks like this and, and, and that type of thing and share my blog, which I think is a disciple-making project, but I'm not, I haven't been as focused on being a personal disciple-maker, which means like my best friend who comes to see me every day, not a Christ follower, and I haven't pushed in with him on that, and I need to do that. So. I'm starting to focus on that more as the ALS diagnosis kicks in and I realize I don't have many days left and if God's called me to do that, then I gotta get at it, all right? And we all do. And um, I mean, there's different ways you can do it. I've got a, a partner of mine at work who's retiring the same time as me. We're both planning on retiring this coming December. and. Um, in January, he gets a diagnosis of stage four prostate cancer. Wow. In March, I get the diagnosis of ALS. And we both start lining up work in June. So another one of our partners, uh, his name's Mike, he makes sure that the three of us, with our wives, get together every other week just to be neighborly to each other. And I uh, realized that um, neither one of them are really disciples of Christ. And I need to be working on that with them, especially with John, who may not have 
as many days left as I do. So keep that in mind. In Romans 10, Paul talks about wanting to see all of the Israelites saved. But Paul knows that many of them do not know Jesus and or they're stuck on the laws of Moses. And Paul wants them to get off the laws of Moses and focus on what Jesus commanded for us. And in verse 14, Romans 10, 14, uh, Paul says about the Israelites, he says, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So that's what Paul said in the scripture. So if you turn that around and read those sentences in reverse order, which I'll do now, the first one is beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. If you are bringing the good news, the gospel of Christ to other people, your feet are viewed as beautiful. Even if you've got calluses on them, or dead skin, or ugly toenails like my mother. All right? Your feet are beautiful if you're bringing the good news to others. The next sentence, disciples or disciple makers, need to be sent on purpose. So you need to know that you have a mission. And we as a church are going to be equipping you to be able to do that in the coming months. And if you do that, then people will hear the good news. If you go out and tell others the good news, people will hear it. And once they hear of Jesus, they will have a chance to believe in him. How can you believe in something you don't know exists? But if you tell them, they have a choice. Will I believe or will I not? And once they believe in Jesus, then they can call on Jesus as their Savior, which is the ultimate gift that we've received. So that's just flipping the scripture around in reverse order and looking at it that way. I imagine that each one of you only believes in Jesus because someone shared the gospel with you. And if they had not done that, how would you have known about Jesus? And if we believe in Jesus and who he says he is, why should we keep it to ourselves? And again, as I said earlier, I'm a good corporate disciple or disciple maker, but not a good personal one. And I haven't really shared that story with too many people. And I need to be doing that because why wouldn't I? Why shouldn't I? If I believe in Jesus, why shouldn't I share that with others? So that's what I need to do. That's what we all need to do. So what do disciples, disciples, disciple makers do? They walk across the street, they befriend a neighbor, they say, or they serve, him or her. Jesus says, you can serve. <laughs> and you start a faith conversation, and then you watch God do the rest. It's not your, your strength. It's God asking you to take the initiative, but it's God's strength that will do it. So God set it out pretty clearly in the Bible that our main purpose in life is to love God and love others. Even if we're doing only good things, and this is important to keep in mind, sometimes our schedules are so full and we're doing good things, like coaching our son's soccer team, which the neighbor, you know, no, nobody else would do it, so you volunteer and do it. It's a good thing. But what's better, coaching your son's soccer team or discipling a neighbor? You know, we have to make these decisions and fit disciple making in. So we need to be looking at the things on our calendar, and we may even have to cut out there may be some bad things we could cut out, but there may be no bad things, just good, but we still need to cut out the good stuff to be able to make room for disciple making. Cut out the bad, cut out the good, and leave the better. And that's become very clear to me. Now that my time on this earth may not last that long. So, it'll last, really. <laughs> if I live, when I live, for another 30 years, yeah. this, would be, this would be my mission. Yeah. Okay. Because if I die in six months, this would come. Yeah. So focusing on what brings God pleasure needs to be our top priority. And as I've said today, uh, here's the summary. Figure out, it's on the slide, figure out who your neighbors are. 
be a good neighbor to them, start a faith conversation, and disciple those same people along the path that Jesus laid out for all of us. And do this starting today, because we don't know what exists for tomorrow. And watch God do the rest. It's all in God's power. Amen. So thank you for listening today.